Well, after those great contributions from the uh, two ministers, just a few words from the faceless bureaucrat, and then uh, I'll let you get into the uh, debate and the discussion. Just, I, I suppose, just from, from my perspective, uh, just a bit of context on the shape of education reform and education reform here in Australia and in New South Wales in particular. I think there's a spotlight on education performance and educational outcomes that we've rarely seen uh, before. We've had the, the debate over Gonski that's lasted some years. We've had the Productivity Commission report last year, endless reports emerging from think tanks. And, and why this focus now? And, and I think clearly it is that after 25 years of sustained economic growth, we understand as a nation that the drivers of, those economic, of that economic growth is unsustainable, particularly the mining boom that we've seen in the last decade. And that Australia's future will not depend on what we can dig up out of the ground, but on the people who walk the land. And the question, the challenge that comes to us, particularly if we look at the international reporting of results in terms of things like uh, the PISA test results, we're asking the question that our education system, which was a source of great pride and a source of you know, high standards on international comparison, we're asking the question is what is it, what is it achieving now and is what it's achieving now uh, good enough? I was reflecting on the famous Donald Horne statement that Australia is a lucky country often cited, often misquoted, because the second half of the sentence that he, that he wrote is rarely referenced. Australia is a lucky country run by second-rate people who share its luck. Um, and Horne's book uh, argued more than half a century ago that, that we face challenges, the challenge of our geographical position in the world, the need for a revolution in economic priorities, and a need for discussion about the sort of country that we want to become. And those debates still all crystallise now when we think in terms of education funding. We understand that there are fierce competing priorities for government expenditure with an ageing population, with increasing health costs, with de um, defence pressures and other matters. So the question is asked, if we're going to spend more money on education, and if we're going to allocate that money, as Gonski suggested, in a, a needs basis, in a sector-blind way, how can we be sure that that expenditure is getting the results that we want, the results that the country needs, that we're getting improved outcomes so that we can lay as a community and society the foundation for what lies ahead? So just a few observations on that debate. The first thing is I think that uh, education needs to be a little bit more like medicine. Uh, it's interesting coming back into the education sector after a, a few decades away, really, um, the fact that, that we do innovate and we have pockets of innovation, but do we do innovation and research in a way systematically that really helps us to conduct trials, to evaluate carefully, to control for that data, to use that data well, and then to scale implementation? I don't think it's been the long-standing pattern uh, uh, in education as a sector. There have been pockets of innovation, pockets of research. I've spoken to senior executives in Google and Microsoft and Apple uh, who tell me all the different work that they are doing in our schools and schools in Australia, but are they doing that work in partnership with us in a way that we can learn from those insights? And if there is breakthroughs that come from that, that we can learn from that and we can scale from that effectively. I mean, education needs to move away from the gut feel, and I think we need to move away from the mystique that all we have to do in education is to go back to how it once was. There are great things in education as it once was, but it, but it isn't always as we remember it. And I'm very glad that my doctor doesn't have a back-to-basics approach to medicine as he reaches for the leeches and uh, tells me he intends to start the bloodletting processes. Um, we need to be aware of the transient enthusiasms. We need to test dogmas and conventional wisdom whilst in valuing engagement and commitment to improve outcomes uh, everywhere. And so our ability, and, and as the Minister referenced, the, the work that we've set up with uh, CC in New South Wales, to really test evidence to set up trials, to look at data, to look at insight, to look at what is working, and just as importantly, to understand what is not working, and then to take those insights from outstanding schools or schools that have stalled and be able to use those insights and deconstruct what is happening at those schools, to be able to spread and disseminate best practice is very important. 
And it's why I think it's really important that the education debate does not get into the, uh, almost an ideological battleground. My, uh, my colleague who runs the Victorian education system, uh, Jill Callister, made an interesting insight that, that if in fact there was a major research piece of uh, research that came out talking about the increase of type 2 diabetes uh, in Australia and the crisis of type two, in type 2 diabetes and the impact that was going to have on individuals and the budget and the community's future, the response would not be to attack the doctors, attack the research, uh, attack the researchers and the doctors for being lazy and incompetent and trigger calls for cuts to health funding. In fact, it would be the absolute opposite. It would, this is a crisis. This is a crisis that we share. This is a crisis that will impact on many of us. We need to invest the money to find the best solutions with the best brains we had to lift outcomes overall. We need to also make sure that we're really measuring the right things. We're measuring what's important that we have a clear understanding about what the demands of the future workforce will be and the young people in our care, what they will need to succeed. A young child who started school this term in New South Wales will start university in 2030, graduate from university in the mid-2030s, retire right towards the end of this century and spend most of their working life in the second half of this century. What will they need to succeed? It's very hard to find experts who will tell you that they understand the jobs that will exist in the second half of the 21st century, but we have a better understanding of the skills and the competencies that will flourish. We will need a strong literacy and numeracy foundation as a building block for all learning. We will need strong foundations in knowledge and the ability to learn and grow on the knowledge we have. And there'll be another range of competencies that will be keys to the future work workplace. We also understand, to draw on the work of Carol Dweck, the, the Stanford psychologist, that young people will need a growth mindset. They will need an ability to learn and learn and learn again and master the new and take on new challenges and learn how to fail and have the resilience that they can master from that and then succeed. I think part of the frustration I have in looking at, at the data that we have is that it's good, but it's limited. It reminds me back in my days at the ABC when I'd get television ratings every morning. They were valuable, but they didn't really tell you the full story. They told you nothing about quality. They told you nothing about distinctiveness. They told you nothing about the role of the public broadcaster. But because they were there, everyone would pay attention to it. I think these measures matter, but they're not the only things that matter. And part of the challenge we face is how we assess improvements in the full range of skills and knowledge that young people will need. I think NAPLAN and PISA are like measuring uh, your pulse and your blood pressure. They're important measures for a you know, doctor to have, but you hope that your doctor will have more profound and insightful uh, tools than that to give us more information so we can make deeper and more specific diagnosis for each child and so we can ensure that each child is learning and we can ensure that each teacher is making the right interventions for every child. Let me just um, conclude with this insight. It's interesting, I think, to look at, uh, at the high-performing systems around the world and we can learn a lot from Shanghai, we can learn a lot from Singapore, we can learn a lot from Finland, but we've got to understand that our schools and our systems are very different to that and we simply cannot import their solutions here. It's quite hard to know how you lift a system as a whole, and there can be a lot of research around that. And we, we are delighted with the, the work that we have from CC that makes it very clear in looking at our schools and looking at schools around the world, what are the characteristics of schools that lift student performance? And there are a number of things we've already heard about tonight, including high expectations, explicit teaching, effective feedback, and the use of data to inform practice. This is what we know works. But, but in, in running the education system, as, as the Minister and I do here with 2,200 schools, how do you do that in 2,200 schools? You do that through great leadership in schools. And I think a clear focus of education reform and lifting the performance of the system is equipping principals to really lead and equipping principals with the research and the data and the tools that they need to lift the system. The Canadian uh, academic and uh, educator Michael Fullan says, powerful principals are obsessed with the instructional core of personalised learning and getting results for each and every student. They make instruction a priority. They deal effectively with distractors. 
they create a culture of job embedded learning. And that's what we're looking to do here. We're looking to skill up our principals. We're providing them with data to their desktop on the performance of their students, the performance of their schools, the performance of their schools in comparison to similar schools. We are looking carefully for, for measures of value adds, schools that not only are guaranteeing a year's learning, a year's progress for every year at school, but schools that are doing much better than that. One of my earliest questions in the department was, tell me about the outlier schools. Tell me about the schools that are, that are defying the demographic destiny of their children and achieving remarkably improved insights. And we go to those schools and we deconstruct their performance and we look at, at, at what they are doing and learn from that. Finally, it, it needs, I think, a mindset of commitment and a mindset of commitment to every child in our school a commitment that every child must improve every year. And we're going to assess them and we're going to teach them and we're going to personalise their learning and understand as we assess them, we're not actually assessing what they're learning, we're assessing how well we are teaching and we are assuming responsibility finally for lifting their performance and lifting their outcomes. I think Dylan William was uh, referenced earlier and I like what he had to say about all this. He said, we need to improve education because of the profound changes that are taking place in society and work. Our world is becoming more and more complex and so higher and higher levels of educational achievement will be needed to be in control of one's life, to understand one's culture, to participate meaningfully in democracy and to find fulfilling work. We need to create a culture in which every teacher accepts the need to improve, not because they're not good enough, but because they can be even better. And when teachers do their job better, their students are healthier, live longer and contribute more to society. There's no limit to what we can do if we support our teachers well. Thank you.